Previews of our Big 12 teams for 2023 roll on here on the Neighborhood Watch. I am Josh Neighbors, joined today by Justin Kuz Walker. You all know him uh, as Kuz from Kuz's Corner. Here to talk about all things West Virginia, one of the more interesting teams in the league this year. But first, Kuz, uh, glad, thank you for being here. It's your first appearance on my new show, The Neighborhood Watch, so glad you're here. Um, Ray Anderson made some comments recently about West Virginia, uh, and I'm not sure where I'm airing this, but, you know, you and I have covered a lot of conference realignment and whatnot. Just mm-hmm. not a great way to endear yourself to the new Big 12 folks and say something disparaging about a place you've never really been to, uh, and you show that you, you have no desire to go there. Uh, I, I thought it was, you know, not to go over the top of it, but just I think kind of is, is a pretty good embodiment of the leadership that was bad for the Pac-12 and thumb mm-hmm. their nose people and i think short-sighted is probably the term that comes to my mind what about you yeah absolutely first of all josh thanks for having me on it's a it's a privilege to be here with you man uh, i love your show and i enjoy working with you but yeah that ray anderson thing i know a lot of people i, I got some pushback on a video i did yesterday that well you guys are getting butthurt over nothing and i'm thinking you know i went back and listened to it in full context to make sure that i wasn't blowing it out of proportion and did I lose sleep over it? No, but when you're the AD of a of a Power Five or any any institution, but much less a Power Five institution, you're just going into a conference that just extended you basically uh, an arm to save you and keep you from falling off the Power Five map, so to speak. And you say that about one of your future conference mates. I think it's extremely short sighted. I think it's unbecoming of a professional in his seat, seat to say it. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, well, he just wants, he just talked about the travel being too far. Well, you know what? West Virginia has been in the Big 12 for over a decade. We've had to fly halfway across the country. And not one time has our AD or our president said he doesn't want to visit one of the other schools. So right. I don't, I don't take that as a legit excuse, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, well, it's just like you, you got to start, you know, the what's made the Big 12 work. And honestly, it actually worried me more than anything. It, what's made the Big 12 work is, uh, I think the fact that they hired Brett Yormark, who's just not a career, you know, uh, college sports guy, and, and the fact that they're like, okay, this is what we need. And so there's already some compromise being made there, right, with the ADs and whatnot. And so I think that compromise has been the name of the game for the Big 12. It's why they're still alive. Mm-hmm. And I, I, don't, I don't get it. Like, I, I don't know where, where these people have missed the boat. Like, guys, compromise is costing you all. Higher opinion of yourself is costing you all. You know, just understanding what you are has what gotten has gotten the Big Twelve into the spot. Mm-hmm. And look, I know West Virginia fans have felt out of place, and I understand that, right? But just you know, timing sometimes West Virginia fans know this better than anybody. Timing can put you in a weird spot, and sometimes you end up in a league you don't want to be. But also, it can be better than the alternative. And so, as opposed to complaining in the beginning, I think you should be just be, especially how like kind of almost chaotic it got. Be grateful you have a home because there are four right. teams in your league that didn't you know didn't get a home. Uh, and I don't think this is the right way to start a, a new relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just unprofessional in my opinion, unprofessional and a little bit disrespectful. All right. Let's talk about West Virginia football this year. So, uh, you know, uh, you and I have talked and my, my thought on Neil Brown is this, is that, uh, I wouldn't even, I think up against the ropes would be a generous way to put his situation. Um, I, you know, I don't. I don't know. Saving his job is something that I think, obviously, you've had to talk about. It's not even something I'm really mm-hmm. entertained because I just think that this was a situation where they're going to make him wear it this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to make him wear it. They're going to make him eat it. Whatever term you want to use. And I, I don't know if that's the right way to go about it, but I kind of understand that, like money wise, it might be. You get a new AD who's kind of getting his, his feet wet. And honestly, it might not be a bad thing considering everything that happened with, with Bob Huggins' situation. It kind of might be nice that, it, you know, all these decisions are having to be made by Ren Baker, you know, while he's still, uh, I guess, in some ways getting adjusted to his time at West Virginia. Right. Yeah, it's – I mean, it's – the verdict's still out, I mean, to be honest with you. I mean, Ren came into a tough situation. You yeah. know, the, 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 I think the president had kind of already made up his mind. He wanted to keep Neil – uh, the new AD claims he agreed with that decision because he needed time to evaluate the program himself. It's mm-hmm. coming into a new job. 
So, I mean, Neil, really, now I don't know what the minimum win total is. And, of course, the AD says you can't put a win total on it because there are so many factors that play a role in that. And I agree with that. I mean, you could have injuries. You know, what if what if your two start, both of your starting quarterbacks or your top two quarterbacks go out? You know, there are so many things that can play a role in it. So, I get that. But I just think Neil Brown is going to have to really pull, I, I don't want to say a miracle, but it's going to take a, a really good season, in my opinion, to make the fan base content and probably to save Neil's job. Eight, you think? I, I think eight, at least talk about it, but I would need nine. I think I would need like a big 12 title. Yeah, you, you're probably more uh, – I'm a little bit more conservative than that. I think seven would probably do it just because of the buyout he has. Okay. Uh, the fan base won't be happy with seven, I don't think, but I think seven will do it just because of the buyout, and West Virginia is just not a school that fires coaches very often yeah I, I would and you and i once again this is the topic you and i have hit but i think it's really important the identity part of it right mm -hmm. like last year i always ask myself what do they do well and, and and you could honestly and you could say this over neil brown's entire tenure like there have been years where they have done things well but last year besides giving the ball to cj donaldson like what was a strength of this football team and look they had a lot of close calls last year obviously that pit game was a very close call the Kansas game was a very close call, but they had a couple of close calls that did go their way. Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State. So, you know, you could say, hey, look, they did they did have a couple of coin flip games. They did win. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's 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 what we're looking at this year. And I think we'll, we'll go with the offense first. They do return basically what the, like the whole offensive line. I mean, yes. you know, most of the offensive basically. line. Yes. Uh Zach Frazier, who you know, there's there's a lot of talk, and I think Zach Frazier is the best center in the league. But if you want to say, hey, I think Cooper BB is the best offensive lineman i think zach frazier's i think there's you know there's you can have a different opinion on all of it mm -hmm. but obviously this guy is first team without a doubt um is this a situation where they're returning an offensive line that you feel good about uh is it a just because they're back it doesn't mean they're good where are you with the offensive line because honestly that's where it kind of starts for this team i feel great about the offensive line i mean we have uh the both the guys that we have playing the tackle spots doug nestor and wyatt milam are both veteran guys nestor will be a senior milam is a uh, junior both have start a lot of starting experience at the Power Five level. Both uh, will likely play on Sundays, or at least have a legit chance to play on Sundays. And when you look at our line stats from last year, I mean their their missed block percentage was really really low, uh, one of the best in the country uh, on missed blocks on run plays or missed assignments on run plays, I should say. So, and the, and they didn't allow a lot of sacks either. And you take take mm -hmm. in the consideration that we had a statue for a quarterback, basically. That, I think that's pretty remarkable. And we played some really good D lines as well. So our offensive line, in my opinion, should be the strength of this football team. That's good news because uh, <laughs> outside of that on offense, I've got some serious concerns. Now, obviously, we go to quarterback, right? Mm -hmm. And so you think this year it's either going to be Garrett Green or Nico Markial, who, I, you know, we've heard, we've heard a lot about Nico. And uh, I think you've got some decent talent there at quarterback. The thing is, like, it's just really unproven. Right, these guys, Correct. they have not – Garrett played a decent amount, I guess you could say. But the way they used him – sometimes, who's other quarterback last year? Totally blanking on who else. JT Daniels. Right. And actually, you talk about statue. I mean, you know, uh, Daigie too. Yes. I, I would say he was even worse. I think, I think Jared Daigie was. was even – Yeah. That's And fair. so they would use Garrett – even when they had JT playing, they would use Garrett sometimes, and it wasn't even like he got the full quarterback experience, right? They would use him you know, as a runner. Now, running mm -hmm. is his strength. Um. I think with that, Garrett's going to be the guy, we think, right? It's kind of the, the the idea. But I think overall quarterback situation, you feel like Nico's kind of the guy of the future potentially. I think Nico's ceiling is higher than, than Garrett's, but Garrett is more ready now to play, in my opinion, because of his experience and his and his age. I mean, Nico's a redshirt freshman, and I'm, I don't feel comfortable going into Happy Valley at night on September 2nd with a, with a redshirt freshman quarterback. Mm -hmm. against that stout Penn State defense. And Garrett, you're right, he is a run – he's been a run first guy to a degree. But I think he's worked on his game. He's worked on his reads and things like that uh, during the offseason. He's studied a lot of film. And I think he's ready. You know, my gut feeling is that Garrett will end up winning the job. I could be totally wrong on that. And I don't think Neil will even probably tell us who's got the job until he has to. Right. Even once, he, even when he knows, he, he's probably not going to make it public. So – uh, but just based on watching the spring game, knowing that Garrett's more experienced, 
And let's keep in mind, this is the first time that Neil Brown's had a, a mobile quarterback since he's been there. He's had Austin Kendall, Jarrett Daigie, and JT Daniels. None of those guys could run with the football. So we're going to get an opportunity to see, okay, can Neil, how good of a play caller is Neil Brown when he has a mobile quarterback? Because his play calling has come into question a lot, and he is going back to calling plays again this year since Graham Harrell moved on. So, you know, we'll see. Is he a really good play caller at the Power 5 level or is he not? This is the year that we will find that out. Do you think he's done that because of the lack of continuity with the coordinators and whatnot? That he's just like, you know what, I, let me just bring this back in-house to me so we, you know, we don't have quarterbacks dealing with different guys all the time. At least, you know, there'll be some familiarity even though Graham mm-hmm. Harrell's gone. Do you think that's kind of the idea is that we're not giving another coordinator to Garrett? I think he just – yeah, I think he just – that, that's probably part of it, but my gut is Neil just trusts – he trusts himself. Uh, he, he has a lot of confidence in himself as a play caller based on his experience. He made a comment the other day in a press conference. He said, look, being a being a good offensive coordinator is the reason I'm here in the first place. Uh, he said, and I've got nine years of head coaching experience, and I spent eight of it or seven and a half of it calling, calling the plays. So, right. And he just – you know, he wants to do what he feels is his strength. And, and I think a lot of it, too, and he's not come out and said this, and he wouldn't, I don't think. But, you know, look, if he's coaching for his job, which most of us think he is. Go out in your own terms. I was nope, say, exactly. I might exactly. as well go out on my own. Yeah, I'm exactly. going to make sure I have a say about how this goes. So let's yep. talk about the running back position, which I think is, is you know, obviously with C.J. Donaldson, that's, uh, that's going to be their strength. Now, you know, behind it, they got a couple interesting guys, but it's going to be Donaldson's really the, the big one. He is a mm-hmm. – Converted was he going to be tight end? I guess you know it's fair, yeah. fair he played to say. wide receiver in high school. Was recruited as a tight end, and now he's a running back. Okay, so so he is uh, besides Zach Frazier, he's he's the best skill position player, I guess, on the offense. I would say. Yes, uh, what a fair. what a freshman season he had! You know, mm-hmm. just unbelievable. And I mean, he was explosive. You know, he can get it done between the tackles. Um, my question though this year is like, how do you make sure you don't just ride the kid into the ground, right? And you know, I I think. Um, He's a really good player, but you, you get, I do get concerned about that for running backs. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, I think now, especially the running back position is one of those where you think about how a guy has to look out for themselves. And I think the way we've watched CJ so far, he's probably got an NFL future. Um, yeah. You know, you, do you want to be in a spot where you're going to get like the Derrick Henry treatment and get that many carries, you know, or mm-hmm. would you rather be in a backfield where like you've got somebody else, you know, that there'd be a more of a split carry situation, and how do you handle that? Because I, I think you hope that CJ's here. He's got going to have one more year. Uh, he's got to stay in college, right? Because he was redshirt. Or, uh, right. Was he, a, was he, he was a true, true freshman, freshman last year. He was a true. So freshman. yeah, he's going to have he's going to have one more year. And so you hope that he, no matter what happens with the coaching situation, he remains. And I mean, if you ride the kid into the ground, he might not be. Uh, he might not be like, all right, you know, this is a situation I want to come back right. to. So how do you think they handle that? Because I, I think that, that is important. Yeah, a couple things there. Number one, we do have a pretty deep running back room. We did lose Tony Mathis. Uh, you know, right. he was our starter going into last year. We lost him to, to the portal. He ended up he had a rough Houston. year, didn't he? I mean, it was yeah, it was he a did. Tough year for him, man. I mean, and, and to be honest, he had already dropped down to about third on the depth chart. Uh, right. So he wasn't going to get as many carries as he wanted at West Virginia. Uh, we've got Jalen Anderson, a guy who kind of came on the scene late last year, had over 100 yards, mm-hmm. I think, in that Oklahoma State game, and uh, or one, one of those final games of the year. So he looked really good. And uh, I think he'll solidify that number two spot. And I think I think we're going to be deep enough there to where CJ won't have to carry the whole load. Uh, they will try to find ways to get him the football, don't no doubt. But I don't think he'll have to carry the load, and I think he'll get plenty of rest. And CJ has done a better job this year taking care of his body. You know, he he didn't know he was going to be a running back last year, so he didn't know he didn't know how to prepare as a running back. Well, during the offseason, season, right. he's gotten in better shape. He's gotten with the strength and conditioning staff. He's gotten with the dietary staff. And he's he's gotten in better shape because he knows now. Look, if I if I want a future at this, I've got to take care of my body, and uh, I think he, so that should help as well. Uh, and look out, we have a true freshman coming in that has looked really impressive, named Jaheim White, mm-hmm. who will likely get some playing time this year. So look out for him as well. He he could he could end up moving up to third or even second on the depth chart if he keeps performing the way he he has been at practice. And with Garrett Green, you're kind of interested by how they use the run game in different ways. Yes. That, this is a team, and because we're getting the pass catchers too, like just a lot of questions. This might be a team that really needs to focus on shortening games and yes. running the football in about as many different ways as possible, just because you've got a quarterback who we're not sure is going to is approve it, you know, not sure about his passing game. He's a good runner. And you've got a receiving core that he really does not have a whole lot of chemistry with because they've got some older guys. Are they bringing Carter? 
Uh, I think they also, let's see who else they, they brought in. Um, the Bram kid as well. So they've got these transfers coming in, but just, mm-hmm. it's just not guys who have a whole lot of chemistry and are, are proven at least in this, in this kind of level, this kind of space. Right. And that's, that is, you know, the whole fan base is concerned about the receiver position. We, we lost basically all of our production from last year, at least about yeah. 85, 90% of it. But let's be honest. Uh, the receiving core we had was not world beaters. Okay. They right. weren't, I mean, yes, Bryce Ford Witten had his moments. He 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 may have a career in the NFL. I'm not taking any, anything away from him, but he did have some. You know, he dropped a lot of balls. The other guys dropped a lot of balls. So if we have a receiving core that can catch the ball more consistently and can do a better job of getting separation with with the defenders, I think we'll be okay there. Uh, I look back and, but I do agree with you that we do need to be a run first team. Uh, I've said that a lot on my own show. I think that's how we win this year. We shorten the game. We run the ball. Use our strength. You know, C.J. Donaldson, Garrett Green, even Nico, when he's in the game, he can run. He's a run, He can run the ball, too. He's no slouch. So, utilize our strengths, man. And, uh, you know, use that big, experienced offensive line. You know, we have some pretty uh, good-sized slot receivers now that we can use to block. Some good blocking tight ends. Let's go run the football. And then I look back to our team when we had Dana here and when we had Skylar Howard at quarterback and we had a 10-win season back in, I think it was 2016, that we kind of used that same mantra. We, we ran the ball a lot with Skyler with the running backs, but then we would break out the play-action pass game, and we threw it deep a lot to people like Shelton Gibson. Uh, mix in some of that. So, you know, only throw the ball when you have to throw the ball, basically, is kind of how I, how I see it. Uh, I don't know if Neil sees it that way, but that's, in my opinion, that's, right. that's how I – that's the identity I'd like to see this team uh, come out with in 2023. Yeah, and you think about you know you know I know that they've they hit their portal pretty hard at the wide receiver spot uh, to just try and try and ensure that thing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know one of the, I mean the highest ranked recruit they had out of this class, Rodney Gallagher, the wide receiver. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you expecting to see some of him this year? I think we will. Uh, he's put on weight. He's put on enough weight now. Coach Brown said to be able to play, uh, and he's done it in just a couple of months. He's only been on campus since June. Uh, they said he's looked good at practice. I don't expect him to come in and catch fifty balls. But if he can come in and catch 20, 30 balls for us, you know, be a little bit of a threat in, even in, on the screen passes and short yardage stuff uh, or intermediate stuff, I think I think that'll be good. Uh, we expect Devin Carter, the senior transfer from North Carolina State, to be our number one mm-hmm. receiver this year. They said he's looked awesome. He's a big body receiver that's good at getting separation. Uh, we have E.J. Horton, the transfer from Marshall, who's a, who's a burner. He's our speed guy on the other side of the field, potentially, if you, uh, assuming he wins the job. And then we've got Deshaun Polk, a small slot type receiver from Kent State, who's got some mm-hmm. speed, but I think they brought him in more of a, more as a kick returner than they did a receiver, to be honest. But uh, and then we've got some guys who you know we hope step up th- that didn't get a whole lot of time last year: Cortez Braham, Jeremiah Aaron, Grayson Malashevich, Preston Fox. We hope some of those guys step up and and you know make a huge leap from uh, their first year, or s- in some cases, second year in the program to, to this year. So look at the defense, and I'm I'm just I it was so rough last year. Now part of that was the offense too, mm-hmm. you know, put him in bad spots. But like this is I, I'm I'm very concerned about this unit because it doesn't feel like they're a unit that's going to generate a whole lot of pressure. I'm not sure they were on turnovers last year, but it felt like you could just Terrible. move, move tear, right. I, I don't, oh, I don't yeah. remember them turning the ball, you know, forcing a lot of turnovers, mm-hmm. move the ball on them pretty easily. I mean, you know. What is the expectation this year, and, and who are the guys to look for? Because it's not like a, it's not a team full of guys that we remember. No, it's it's. I'm not gonna lie. This is the big concern on this team is can this defense improve? Now, I, here's my thoughts on it. We were 110th, 120th, somewhere in that range on defense last year. Right. Uh, we're even worse in the past game. Right. If we can be 50th or 60th in the country in defense, total defense, I think we got a shot to be decent. Um especially if we run the football well and control the clock. But, right. you know, last year we lost a lot of guys with the portal. They had to fill holes with guys with transfers who didn't, in a lot of cases, didn't didn't pan out, didn't turn out to be not very good. We've had to do that again this year, unfortunately. We've lost guys to graduation and, and or the portal. We're once again having to fill holes with transfers. So, you know, it's a little, little bit nerve-wracking to have to do that again because you never know with these transfers – a couple of them, especially coming from you know lower levels, how are they going to pan out? The only the positive I take from it though is we do have some guys coming back from last year that were freshmen and sophomores last year, 
or, or just weren't ready to play that got thrown to the Wolves a year ago due to injuries mm-hmm. and, and things like that. They do have a, another year of experience under the belt. Guys like Andrew Wilson Lamp, Jacoby Spells, Malachi Ruffin, those those types of guys that Hershey McLaurin, they 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 have a lot of experience. And then we have a guy back there in Aubrey Burks, who's a preseason all big twelve guy that I think can be a leader back there for him, kind of be the quarterback of the of the secondary. Uh hopefully he can keep them all, you know, doing the right thing and keep them keep them on track back there. Um linebacker spot, you know, Lee Coba should be good. Huge question mark at the weak side linebacker spot. They tried to go get somebody out of the portal, was was not able to find anybody. So that they're relying basically on uh, a couple guys who have never played before. One, one's a true freshman and, and a couple uh, retro freshmen that just haven't seen the field other than special teams. So a little bit concerning at that spot, not going to lie. Um, they might have to do some shoveling at that spot. That'll be a huge question mark. And then up front, we do have Sean Martin returning from last year. He was our starting defensive tackle or defensive end from last season. He ended up replacing Taj Austin about two or three games in as a starter and, and held the spot. But we lost Dante Steeles, man. Dante Steeles is a huge loss right. on that defensive front. So uh, we got to hope the guys that are coming back, we do have some experience up there. Not a lot of starts, but we do have some experience. So hopefully those guys can – I don't expect them – I don't think they need to be great, but if they can be good, I think we have a shot to be a much better – and much improved defense in 2023. So here is how the schedule sets up for West Virginia this year. Uh, I, I think this Texas Tech game is going to end up being huge because I think it maybe swing the pit game. I'm not sure how good Pitt's supposed to be this year, but I, I feel like it's going to be a potentially a, a one and a one and two start. I mean, they need to get out of that first month two and two. I think because if you're mm-hmm. one and three with road trips to Texas. You know, play TCU in Houston. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm pretty skeptical at that point of, of how you you rectify it because that 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 might have one and five written all over it, and I'm not even sure Neil Brown gets to get to one and five, right? Uh, I think if you you know you go one and three, one and four, you, you're done for. So that, that that stretch, the Pitt Texas Tech stretch to me in the first four is mm-hmm. we have to split those games, right? And the good news is they're both at home, but they have to split those at least. I agree, I totally agree with you. And Neil Brown hasn't beaten Texas Tech in his career. He's zero and four against them, right? Uh, even when they were bad, we still lost to them. The Pitt game, like you said, I think I, I put it as a toss-up game because I do think Pitt will be a good team, but it is in Morgantown. And, you know, with that being a big rivalry game, you know, I give us a slight edge there. Mm. But, yeah, I'm with you, man. If we, if we go into that bye week, one and four, who knows what could happen at that point? Yeah, and I has I hesitate to look even the rest of the way because like I I it's almost like it's not even worth looking at, right? I mean, it, you know, we might have a different coach here as we head into the later part of the year, but also it's like, okay, good news is you know they get two of those three games at home. The first they have three games in a row mm-hmm. at home the first month, but then in that October, I mean, they're playing, you know, uh, or you know they got a buy obviously, but they have three games, uh, two of which are on the road. And, uh, you know, the, the road games, and the good news is they got Houston, they're at, uh, U, you know, UCF, but also that's good to OU and to Baylor later on in the year. Mm-hmm. So it's a weird mix, but like, it's just, those are, I mean, good Lord, they're going to be underdogs in every single one of the road games I play this year. Right. <laughs> that's, Basically. Yeah. It's going to be, yeah. a, you know, underdog maybe, in, maybe not. Houston. We'll probably be underdogs at Houston, even though I don't think we should be, I think we will be. Yeah. But, but, um, uh, cause I don't think Houston's going to be very good this year, to be honest. Yeah. I'm but, not sure they're going to be that good either. Yeah, but so uh, but, but, but what's you, your expectation for record wise though? What what do you think record wise? In my head, and I haven't done I haven't done my preseason breakdown game by game breakdown yet, but just in my head, looking at that schedule, I think we can, I think we can pull seven out, seven seven and five is probably my, you know, my prediction. Uh, six and six probably more likely, just because of that tough out of conference schedule. I do like the fact that we have all four of the newcomers, and there there should be some growing pains for those newcomers. Yep. Uh, so if we can win at least three of those games, maybe even all four, I think that gives us a shot to, to get to bowl eligibility at least. But those those t- games against the current existing B, uh, Big Twelve teams are all going to be brutal games. I mean, Oklahoma State should be better. TCU, I don't think. I do think TCU will take a step back, but they're still going to going to be a good football team. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough one, man. It's gonna be a grind for sure. But uh, I just gotta hope that this team, you know, they do have a very big chip on their shoulder. They're not happy about being picked last in the conference preseason. So hopefully they can take that and and use it for 
for good and, and turn this thing around and turn the ship around. All right, Coos, where can people find you and your work and all of its variety? I am at Coos's Corner. It's C-O-U-Z apostrophe S Corner on YouTube. I cover West Virginia football. I cover a lot on conference realignment, touch on a little bit of Big 12 stuff. So you can find me over there. I'm on Twitter at Coos206 if you want to interact with me there. Uh, I do have Instagram, TikTok, and all the other stuff as well, but I'm just not real active. But, uh, but come, if you want to interact with me, come check out all the social media platforms. Justin Coos Walker, we appreciate your time, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely, Josh. Thanks again for having me on.